All right. Technical session number 35, Windows Networking. I'm going to talking about the various different ways we can network with our Windows machines with built-in tools that they already have in place. We'll be talking about groups, home groups, work groups, domains, fun stuff like that. Our objectives for this technical session are is to be able to configure Windows networking, differentiate between administrative shares and network shares, recognizing how to establish network communications and configure network properties. When working in the Windows ecosystem, there are three basic networking uh, types that you can choose from. You got your work group, your home group, and your domain, and depending on what it is you're doing, how many people are involved, and uh, the tools you will be using will determine which of these you will rely upon more heavily. First one we want to get into is our work group. It is the most basic and simplest of the three, thankfully. Um, they lack any form of centralized control, so you don't have a central place where everything is coming to for information. It is a peer-to-peer -peer network where everybody's kind of sharing with everybody else. Um, by default, the work group is called work group, although you can change that so that if new computers enter into the system, they don't automatically get added to your work group. Um, every computer on the network needs to utilize the same work group to be able to share resources, be it documents, videos, um, what have you, music. And each computer must maintain a list of usernames and passwords. This is where it becomes a pain for IT. Now, we said typically you would utilize very few computers with this, if you remember. Uh, does anybody remember where the maximum you would comfortably want to be at, where it starts to get a little bit chaotic if it exceeds that number? So what is that? 10. Very good, Janina. So 10 is about our comfort level. Once you start exceeding 10, it starts to get more and more difficult to be able to communicate over the networks. And then they say there is a maximum allowable uh, group with 20. Now, if you're working in multiple shifts, this can be maneuvered pretty easily. Um, but if it's everybody working at the exact same time, it's going to be very difficult to get things done because of a lot of bottlenecks created in the peer to peer share. Also, the usernames and passwords. So for security reasons, you may have it set up that you want to change the password about every three months or so. Now, here's the problem is when you change the passwords, you now have to update those passwords on every computer. So if you have 20 computers in a work group, how many computer passwords need to be updated every three months? 20. Okay, well, we've, we've taken care of one computer now. Because every password needs to be maintained on every computer. Like so 20 times 20 gives you 400 passwords that would need to be updated every three months. Can, so, you, can you repeat the uh, scenario? So how many computers would that be? 20? So 20 computers and the sign in and passwords for all 20 computers would need to be maintained on every single computer. So 20 passwords times 20 computers that's 400 passwords that the IT personnel now have to update once every three months. No fun. So that's part of why they say when you start getting past 10, it starts becoming more difficult for IT to manage. So works with very, very small groups. If you're in an office of like four to five people, work group may be perfect. So you have four to five people and then a uh, network attached storage, good to go. All right, here is a visual representation in your control panel home. 
down near the bottom, it will show you which work group you are a part of. And just making sure that everybody is on that same work group, you can change the name of it if you so choose. But the default name will always just be work group. Questions so far? All right. Next up to bat, our home group. Obviously created for home use in mind with a small number of users to facilitate the easily sharing files and printers. We have one set up at our house where my main computer that I use is kind of the multimedia server and everything for the rest of the household. I just allow sharing for everybody within it um, and then use you know, some other security methods in place to make sure if outside people come in, even if I give them my network password, they don't have access to my systems. All right. Now with this particular one, it's not maintaining the passwords of all computers on all systems every time. You have a singular password um, and name for the home group as a whole. It'll share the libraries, like your, your music, your pictures, your videos, all that fun stuff, not specific folders. Um, and it has its own little applet on the control panel to go look for files, but it requires Windows 7 or above in order to enact this. Questions so far? All right. Here is the home group applet settings, just to kind of give you an overview to let you know you'll be able to determine what you want to share with the home group and what you don't. Uh, it may just be music, videos, and uh, pictures. You may not want to share your documents or your printers with the other people on the home group. So you can make those determinations from right here once it's established. Lastly, and the most common you will run across in enterprise situations would be the domain. And this is set up in like a client server network where you are reaching out to a particular set of systems in order to share resources and things of that nature. It is implemented on larger private networks, typically in office, like larger offices and universities. It forms a logical group of computers together that are controlled through centralized directory databases. Um, security policies for the entire group are determined by administrators. The Windows server, or also known as the domain controller, maintains control of the network using a directory database service called Active Directory. Anybody here familiar with Active Directory? Had to use it before, you know, heard it mentioned in their office. Marvin is quite familiar with it. He spends his, uh, his day trying to lock me and Avery out of anything. There's a good test out lab for it. Yes, there is a good test out lab for Active Directory. Now, the biggest benefit of Active Directory is you are able to log into essentially any computer and be able to access the domain and your files, so long as the files are being you know, shared on the servers rather than locally. Most enterprise settings, they will set them to be stored on the server rather than on your individual computers. Questions so far? All right. How to share files or folders in a work group. Basically, you find the folder you want to share, select it, right click, go to properties. 
click on the sharing tab, move forward to advanced sharing, and then click on share this folder, and then you're going to decide your permissions, and then you click OK. Does anybody know what they mean when they're stating permissions on a file? Like whether they can um, read, write, the type of access they can have to the file? Exactly. Read, write, execute. Are they only going to be able to read the file and not manipulate the file at all? Are you going to allow them to edit the file? Or are you going to allow them full administrative control where they can remove the files and do what have you? So these are things that we need to take into account when we are sharing our files. So you may have like only your, de like only your department can edit, only you would have administrative control, and then everybody else can just read what you've done. So you have layers of group settings that you will be establishing when you are setting up the shares of your files. Questions so far? Now, under computer management, you can go to shared folders and see what file, what folders and, and what have you are shared with you. So if you have external uh, files that you need to gain access to and stuff like that, and this would be where it would be located when you are on the domain. All right. Questions? Avery? Um, oh, go ahead, Janine. Sorry. Um, so, I don't know if that was a lab or not. Yeah, it was a lab where we were adding users and taking away users and, and adding um, um, like permissions and taking away mm -hmm. permissions. Um, is that sort of what you're talking about? I don't know. That's I might have probably one of the labs. Yeah. There are a few different ones. Mm, okay. Was that in Coursera or was that in Test Out? I think it was Test Out. Okay. Um, well, there's the one where you're first getting in and you're the administrator on the computer. That's going to be a little bit different than when you're administrating the domain and you would utilize something like Active Directory. So you might be thinking of the one where you were the administrator on that actual computer and adding and removing users and permissions on that computer versus when a domain is established and you're setting it up for people across the board. But same principle, just scaled up. Anything to add there, Avery? Uh, no, I think that covers it. The, the test out labs give you a, a really good idea of what you'll be doing with it. Very good. Back to old test out. We will be revisiting a lot of those labs once we start moving into testing mode or test prep mode. And so you will see a lot of those again. Um, as well as on top of the uh, guided study groups and uh, mocks we'll be doing. And that's coming up real quick. All right, administrative shares. These are created on the servers themselves, uh, mostly built for administrative purposes. Um, typically how you would notate them if you were an administrator is the dollar sign at the end of the name, as you can see right here, that would be an indicator of an administrative share. If you do not have administrative level access, likely these files will be hidden from you so you are not able to see them. And you would have one set up for each volume on the drive. You would have one on C and D and so forth, however many volumes you have created, uh, because you're not limited in the number of volumes you can create for the most part, as well as your admin. And these are created for use by administrators. And if you want to have any kind of access to them, you need to be an administrator or have administrative privileges yourself. 
But just thing to recognize is, is when you see a dollar sign at the tail end of it, that is an administrative share file. All right, network shares. They can exist on a network, but you can also map them so that they appear to be local to your systems. This is what is typically done. Um, instead of just creating these network shares, they will do a what's called a share drive, and they will map that drive from your computer to the share computer. And so it will appear as like drive S on your system, and that will be your shared drive, which is a remote drive uh, in the server. And typically that's where you would look for all your files and save all your files too. Um, but mapping a drive is basically you're creating out the entire you know, file map to get from you all the way to that shared drive and be able to create it. Thankfully, a lot of times that map will have been created for you, but there are ways to find it um, where you can right click and you can see the map on the file itself. You copy it um, and then you can put it in so that somebody else can map to it. Mapping is typically done in Windows Explorer or disk management. And now you can say you are familiar with mapping network drives. There is a test out lab on this one as well. I would definitely recommend practicing that one because that one is really good for practical real life use. So it's one that you will um, utilize quite a lot in the IT field. Although many times they'll build the mapping into the images so that when the images are placed in the computers, the maps themselves are created as well. Questions? All right, little video. Share my sound. All right, well, let's jump into it. Here I am desktop and I want to make some files available on my laptop. I use this hard drive here, my G drive. It's a two terabyte hard drive connected to my desktop and I want to make these files available Sound good. on my laptop. Now, let's say these thumbnail images, I'll click into this. These are all my thumbnail images for YouTube. Yeah pictures of myself all the time anytime I want to create a thumbnail and so here you kind of see a little bit of the behind the scenes of how I do things now I want to make these available on my laptop because I don't like just sitting at my desktop creating thumbnails I'd rather be on the couch uh, and create thumbnails from there um, so what I'm going to do is I want to make this entire drive available so I could get to it on my laptop so what we're going to do is first off I'm gonna go ahead and click, right click on the G drive. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go down to the option that says properties here at the bottom of the list. Let's go ahead and click on that. And then this dialog pops up and it has all these different options across the top. What we're, what we're interested in doing is I wanna share this with my laptop. So we're gonna click on the one that says sharing. Within sharing, it says it's not currently shared, but there's an option here for advanced sharing. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And within here, I wanna click on um, share this folder. And here the share name is just G because it's my G drive. I could also click into permissions and here I'm allowing anyone to access it. And I could give full control where people can um, add new items. They could delete existing items. They could rename things. So you could also uh, simply set someone to change, uh, but I'm just gonna set it to read so they could read the contents here. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on okay. Now, when you're connecting to public networks and stuff of that nature, you should be sure that you're protected from hackers or other nefarious actors, so to speak. 
So from Windows 7 up, they offer three network security options when you are dealing with uh, networks that you interact with on a regular basis. Now, when you are hooking up to a public network, like Starbucks or something like that, first off, I'm going to say, please don't do this. I understand the Wi-Fi is free, but so is the data theft. So if you hook up to a public network, you can uh, have network discovery is turned off and then they cannot join your home group or your domain. But anything that you send out over that network is likely, likely going to be visible depending on what you're using. I agree it is trendy, Marvin. Um, home network. This is uh, your network discovery itself is turned on and you can join the home group and then all the permissions you have established in place um, will already be active. And then finally, you have your work network, uh, which is your network discovery is turned on and you can join the domain for your work, but you cannot join a home group. So one is turned on, one is turned off at that point. And this is typically in enterprise settings as we talked about earlier. Here's what it would look like in your uh, network locations. When you establish a connection with a new network that it is not familiar with, it will straight out ask you, is this a home, work, or public network? If it's one that you are not on regularly, like if you're over at somebody's house that you don't normally uh, spend a lot of time with or on the networks, public is probably the best option because you don't necessarily know what security protocols they have in place on their systems. And if there is infected computers on their systems and you interact with them, congratulations, you could pick up that, inter that infection. Questions so far? It's a good question, Avery. That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm saying. Although likely if they've, the been there working on, if they've been there working on that laptop for hours, they're likely sniffing for data from other users. <laughs> oh, Bill, he's our best customer. He's here every day, all day. Always working on that book he's writing. <laughs> yes, Ranzi. Mm. Well, can you go back to the slide, the previous slide? on the different types of networks. Sure. So, so it says here that for the public public network, network discovery is turned off and you cannot join home group or domain. It seems, I feel like I I'm not understanding. It's not looking for groups to connect with. Okay. So, you know, it's what it's saying is, is it's not looking for a work group or a home group or anything like that to share files with or look for shared files. It has that feature turned off because you would not be looking to do that over a public network. You kind of want to be an isolated node on that network. It's trying to protect you as much as it can for being on an open network, basically. Yeah. But you're giving it fair warning. I'm on a public network. I don't fully trust this network, so I don't want people on this network having access to my files and folders. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay yes, Humberto. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was just thinking about it in a weird way. Like, well, I'm not. Yeah. Like, I would. Why am I turned off? Then I wouldn't have access. But this is for people to see me, not for me to. Yeah, but it's also so you're not trying to connect to other people's systems, like. If you have somebody who's got like really bad malware in their system and they're trying, they're actively trying to infect you, they may have their work group on and open, hoping that you'll connect to it and not pay attention. And then you'll connect with their home group and they can upload files to your system. So not only are you not looking, you're not other allowing other people to hook up with you as either. Uh, yes, Umberto. Yes, but if you are in a public network and using VPN, 
would you be allowed to go to a home group or domain? You mean if you're like VPNing into your, mm -hmm. your network? Yeah, you can do that. Even if you are in a public network? Yes. Well, you would VPN into like, in that case, what you would be doing is you would be doing a remoting into like a main computer. Like if I had my laptop with me, I'd be remoting in using port forwarding or something like that into my current computer and working from there. If you were hooking up with your office and trying to work on your um, email servers and stuff like that while you're at lunch and you're just using that public network in order to do so, yes, you can VPN in. The VPN offers a little extra protection, uh, protection by encrypting any transmissions that are made. Um, so that, that adds to your layers of security. But yes, you technically could do that. But it would not allow you to do it where you're sitting on that network. The VPN on your system understands that you're commuting remotely to another system. Good question though. Any other questions? All right, establishing network connections. Typically down in your bottom uh, right-hand side of your screen, which is called what? Amnesia sets in in the afternoon. So what's that bottom right-hand side of your screen called? Notification. Notification or as Mark says, system tray. System tray, very good. So notification nice. area or system tray. Down in that area, you should be able to see a little globe which you can click on and it will open up your network options and you can select which kind of network you may want to use. You could go through the connection wizard and try to set it up, you can establish a dial-up connection. If everything else is not available, that would be an option. Um, you could connect to your workplace utilizing your VPN. So this is where you would actually set that up to be able to turn that on. You could connect to a wireless network and make that happen, or you can connect to a local area network. And you could do that through setting up a new network. And you could tell it to prioritize one type of network over another if both are available. Like if you have a wired connection versus a wireless, wired would be the preference. Now, we're familiar with our wireless because we just talked about that yesterday. And then we got our dial up, which we talked about, which is exceedingly slow. And then we have our broadband. Once we know what kind of uh, network we are hooking up to, then we would establish it from here. Does anybody understand, know what PPPOE is? I know it's something power over Ethernet, but I'm not sure about the other two Ps. Well, POE, yeah, would be power over Ethernet. What if I took away the OE? Are you familiar with PPP? Point to point protocol. Point to point protocol. Nice and quick though. Older network protocol. Uh, but they also have point to point protocol over Ethernet, which is a little bit more robust version of that same protocol. All right, once you have determined which type of network is gonna be, be it wired, wireless, what have you, um, you're gonna to need to add that network name. Um, what 
if you're using a wireless, obviously choose uh, what security type you're going to be utilizing. And even if you have WPA2, you may, it'll give you the option to use TKIP or AES. So if you have a system that does not accept AES, it'll allow you to do WPA2 with TKIP. In reality, what that is, is that's just WPA. Even though it says WPA2, it's still utilizing the lesser encryption standard of TKIP, so then it becomes basically WPA. Can you Why do it they... on a home network? I'm sorry. Hmm? Let me do what? On a home network. What, changing your encryption security? Uh-huh. Yeah. So like if you, when you logged into your routers, did you see the ability to um, change your security? Yeah, but that was before I knew all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> But now you do. So now you go on there and you can look and see what security standard you're using. And if it is the most robust one you can be using, or is it a scenario where it is turned down a little bit because maybe some of the stuff that's on your network is not able to interact with the AES? Yes, Mark. Could you repeat what you were saying about the, um, about the WPA2? And okay. it's not the actual... Um... So WPA2 uses the encryption protocol AES, right? In order to uh, encrypt our data over the, over the network. Some older systems may not have the capability to interact with AES, so they have to utilize TKIP. So what it'll show, it'll say security type WPA2, encryption type TKIP. Basically, that just means you're operating off of WPA, not WPA2. I'm not sure why they did this instead of just saying like you have to operate off of WPA, but this is something that is a thing. Like when I hooked up uh, my Wii U not too long ago, it would not interact with the internet at all if AES was turned on. I had to dumb it down to TKIP in order to interact with the internet. But then the firmware went to update, had a power hiccup, and broke the device. So it kind of worked itself out. <laughs> All right, here's a little bit more of a visual representation where it's kind of showing you. Uh, if you're directly, it shows your, your main computer or host connecting with the local systems. And then it may show a glow beyond it where it's hooking up. It shows everything's good. Uh, if you're connecting through a VPN, it'll show you going to the internet and then to your servers and give you green lights on both of these like or the nice check marks. If something goes wrong, you get the bad red X and uh, you have to go back, figure out likely it is a username and password issue. Uh, to establish, sometimes there is a hiccup in the community, you know, in the connection process, and it just needs to be reattempted, and it goes through pretty, uh, pretty well after that. So, any questions so far with regards to that? All right. Lastly, setting up a dial-up. You need to have, obviously, a phone number to be able to establish uh, that internet connection. So you'll be able to dial in to, you know, it needs to know exactly which phone number it's dialing into. Um, and then the username and password that was given to you by your internet service provider in order to establish that connection. There's a really good lab with this one. There's a really good lab with this one? Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's not bad to have this if you don't have a data intensive network, like if you're mostly transmitting spreadsheets or emails, things like that, things that aren't real graphics intensive. This is a great tertiary backup system to have in place. Just have it there as an option. If everything else fails, you can still maintain basic communication. If you already have the heart, you know, the POTS lines set up in your uh, network, it's a good backup. Although a lot of people, if you have the POTS lines, they'll set up an ISDN. Um, over their phone line, I have a friend. She is a doctor 
down in Miami and she does radiology. She works from home for the most part, uh, going over x-rays and stuff like that. She, the main thing that, that was a requirement for her to be able to work from home was she had to have guaranteed internet service. So she actually has to maintain two internet service providers. She has her main one that she deals with. And then she has an ISDN backup uh, that has auto switching between the two. If one drops, the other one picks back up. And so in order for her to be able to, you know, work from the comfort of her own office, she has to have dual connections. Kelly. Yep. I'm noticing a trend. Abra keep telling us that all the things are on are test out. <laughs> so it's almost <laughs> like the labs are there to help you. Right. Like, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> trend, trend. Also, your um radiologist friend, is she nice? Depends on who she's talking of, to. That, that's what I figure. Okay. And that's 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 all I need to know. Her husband's an IT, so she actually is very nice to her IT people. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that's good. That's refreshing. <laughs> So Not always the case. Now, if you're one of her kids and you get out of line, she puts you back in line. Not so nice. Not so nice. <laughs> so, all right. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. Yeah. No, she, you know, being, being the fact that she is married to IT, she is nice to IT. Because if she's not, then he gives her a whole, a whole bunch of, uh, a bunch of flack for it. Like you know, those people are working hard, right? You're right, right, exactly. All right. Questions so far. So this is in the bottom hookup, setting up dial-up connection, and you just need some basic information from your internet service provider in order to have that locked in place. Now. All right, network card properties. Sorry, they aren't talking about promiscuous mode on this particular one, although that is a network property you can set up if you're setting up a, what kind of um, system? Talked about it briefly in security. securing our network. It's not going to protect you, but what will it do? We have to go over our NIDs again. Can you repeat the question? Um, now, if I was setting a network card, why would I set a network card to promiscuous mode, which means it just basically takes in every single packet that goes across that internet and records it? Who is sending it? Who is receiving it? What was in the packet? As much information as you possibly can, times, dates, all that kind of fun stuff. In a security setting, when would I actually want to set a network card to do something like that? for intruders yeah to look for intruders to look for attacks we would want to be able to detect attacks so we would have a network intrusion detection system which would be a computer on the network with its nick card set to promiscuous mode logging every interaction that happens on that network and then if um certain things get way out of alignment, like if traffic spikes real heavily, um, if you're seeing multiple requests from the same location, like we're talking hundreds or thousands of times a second, obviously that is not a user trying to do that. That is a system is under attack. So at that point it would notify the uh, IT team, hey, you have a problem on this sector, please check it out and see what's going on. So network intrusion detection system or NIDS. And it detects, it does not prevent. That would be NIPS, N-I-P-S. And that would take steps to actually mitigate the attack. 
So in our effort to optimize performance on our network interface card, we would need to know how is it going to communicate with the network? Is it going to communicate with half duplex, full duplex, or auto? What speed are they going to be talking? Are we going to establish a wake on LAN? How is the quality of service established? And most of this can be configured within the onboard NIC from the BIOS. And we're dropping like flies. All right, duplexing. This is the means by which communication takes place. So we have half duplex, which means it can go either direction, but only one direction at any given time. What do we call it when it can only go one direction, doesn't matter what time. It's just, it can only travel one way across the line, that's it. What do we call that? It's not half duplex, what is that? Going back to week one here. Cool. Very good, Janina. Simplex. simplex. Pretty simple. <laughs> so it can only travel in one direction regardless. And we have half duplex where it can go either way, but only one direction at any given time. And then we get to full duplex, which goes both directions, sending and receiving at the same time. Thankfully, they have, uh, in most modern NICs, made it a pretty easy for us where it's done automatically. And when we hook it up, it auto senses what is, you know, which kind of communication is being used by the system you're attached to and adjusts itself to that. Um, if, a, if it senses that another card essentially is connected at half duplex, it will go ahead and set itself to half duplex in order to maintain that communication properly. Speed. This is very important on networks. Everything has to be talking at the same speed. Otherwise, we won't be able to understand each other. So it needs to be compatible with the network on which the host resides, for example, um, a 100 base T card is connected to a thousand base T network. The network will need to operate at 100 megabits per second to match the rest of the network. Doesn't matter how fast the T card in that system is, it's going to have to slow down to be able to communicate with the network. And the speed itself is set in conjunction with whichever duplex you are using. Questions so far? Now, in your properties for your NIT card, you can link speed duplex in advanced settings and then adjust it manually, or you can have it set to auto detect and adjust depending on which network it is attached to. Questions so far? All right. Wake on LAN or W-O-L. This is a nice little ethernet standard. It has to be pre-established in your system um, that will allow a sleeping machine to be a, awoken up when it receives a signal from the uh, wake up signal from the network. This is exceptionally nice for those of us who work in IT. That way, if people, you know, shut all their systems down, we can wake those systems up in order to do updates in the middle of the night. And uh, it's a little less problematic if they shut their systems down. It is activated essentially under your network adapter settings. It also is nice if you have a system on at your house and it allows you to remote in even if the system uh, is in sleep mode. 
So it'll send that wake signal to it and allow you to gain access from there. Questions so far? Starting to get nostalgic for the uh, Starship Troopers movie. If any of you ever saw that, it's a real B movie, sci-fi back in the day. And these really cheesy commercials in there. And at the end, the guy was always go, would you like to know more? <laughs> good book, he, a good book, but the movie was a, a terrible representation of the book. All right. Next, quality of service. Talked about this one quite a bit. We can establish that within the NIC, how to prioritize uh, what packets get what priority um, in order to control the flow of traffic in order to maximize our network transmission speeds. <clears throat> And then a BIOS. Now, most older devices, the network cards were manually installed. More modern ones, it's already integrated into the motherboard. And typically, you would only add a network card if the one in the motherboard itself gives out. And then it will, you would still be able to add a network card at that point. And then you would need to make sure um, it is enabled in the BIOS. Yes, Bert. Yes, uh, to set a uh, quality of service, we have to set it in the NIC and also in the switch. Yes, well, you can do it. On, you can do it in both places. Now, for your host PC, like at your house or small offices, you'd probably do it in quality of service because typically you would have an unmanaged switch um, managing your traffic. If you had a managed switch, you could go in, which is a much larger um enterprise level switches and unmanaged switches probably like the little boxes like the 8 10 12 or 16 port switches you'll buy uh rather inexpensively online but if you have like a large enterprise switch yeah you could go in there and set quality of service there too but this gives you another place where you can set it if you wish all right oh no quiz So scary. Three whole questions. 